Maria from Four Season Foraging here to talk to you today about rose hips. Uh, but before I get into the video, just wanted to say thank you for watching. If you like it, please hit the like button, subscribe to my channel, and ring the bell for notifications. It helps me out a lot. So before I get into identification and edibility and all that, I just wanted to clarify that for the purposes of today's video, I'm talking specifically about wild rose species. And the reason for that is that there's a lot of different cultivated species. There are also hybridized species, uh, hybrids between wild varieties and cultivated varieties. And in my research, I just haven't found anything confirming whether all the cultivated varieties are edible and medicinal in the same way as the wild ones. So I just want to go on the safe side and stick specifically to the wild varieties. But if you have some information about this, especially if you have links to scholarly articles about it, or at least an article with reputable citations, I would love to see it because I would love to solve this mystery myself. <laughs> so comment down below if you know something about that. Thanks. So what are rose hips? You might have heard the term before, but not have a great understanding of what it means. Most simply put, rose hips are the fruits of the rose plant. Next to me here we have a rose bush and all of these orangish, reddish, berry-like fruits are the rose hips. So in summer, the rose puts out beautiful flowers and those flowers develop into these fruits called rose hips which contain the seeds. Uh, I don't know why they're called that. It's kind of a strange name when you think about it, but that's what they're called. Now there are many species of wild roses that grow across the US. They're all in the genus Rosa, and they share some common identification traits. So when I talk about identification today, I'm gonna give you some general tips that covers all of the wild roses, but of course the specifics are gonna vary depending on the exact species that grows in your area. Now wild roses are widespread in the US. They grow in all 50 states, and they usually grow in sunny places or forest edges or open forests. So you'll find them in trail sides, savannas, meadows, open woods, places like that. So roses grow as a small or sometimes a large shrub. They really vary in size. Sometimes they'll be only a foot high. Sometimes they'll be like this one, which is maybe about three feet high. And some varieties grow really tall. They can grow up to 12 feet high and they form these like dense, impenetrable thickets. So depending on where you live and what's around you, there could be a lot of variation on the size of the roses. However, the roses you find in your area will likely be thorn. So this one has thick recurve thorns on it. Uh, some of them are more spiny or prickly looking, but most wild roses do have thorns on them. And the leaves will be arranged alternately on the stem and they are compound leaves. So this here is all one leaf. It's what's called pinnately compound, where you have the center line coming down and a leaflet at the tip, and then leaves coming off on either side. Versus palmately compound, where the leaves are all coming out, where the leaflets are all coming out from one single point, like fingers from a palm. And if you look closely at the leaves, you can see that they are serrated. And at the base of the leaf stem, or petiole as it's called, you'll often find these little stipules, or they're basically little leaf-like appendages that come off either side of the petiole. There's some variation among the flowers. They're usually pink or red in color, 
but sometimes you'll find wild roses that are white or even yellow in color. However, they are all five petaled and they have five sepals, which are little green leaf-like appendages that in this case grow under the flower. And the center of the flower will have like a fuzzy, bushy kind of appearance. And that's from all the stamens and pistils of the flower, which are the reproductive parts of the flower. Now the rose hips themselves can vary quite a bit too. They're usually red in color, sometimes they're more of an orangish tone, but often red. And they vary quite a bit in size. These are on the smaller end. These are maybe a quarter inch in diameter, but sometimes you'll find them as big as an inch or if you're lucky, even an inch and a half in diameter. They almost always have the remnants of the sepals on there. So look like a leafy five pointed star at the bottom or the top of the fruit, depending on which way you're looking at it. Similar to the five pointed star you see at the bottom of apples or pears which are also in the rose family, so they're related. These ones here in particular, the sepals on the fruit aren't very defined. You can see the remnant of the sepal, but there isn't really much definition. Like the leafy part has mostly fallen off. But some of them that you see will have very distinct sepals on them. Now rose hips are primarily used for edible purposes. They do have some medicinal qualities and that's mostly because of their high vitamin C content. They're extremely high in vitamin C, anywhere between 25 to 50 times as much vitamin C as a citrus fruit. So one of the highest vitamin C plant sources on the planet. It's really amazing. Really great that we have this resource in our own backyards and surrounding fields and forests. So you might have heard about like in World War II England, for example, it was really popular to gather rose hips and turn those into a syrup for a vitamin C supplement, uh, which was given mostly to children. And the reason was that they weren't able to import all the fruits that they usually did. They weren't getting all the citruses because of wartime disruption in trade. So instead, the government really encouraged people to get out in the countryside and the hedgerows and forage wild rose hips and turn them in to be processed into syrup. So rose hip syrup was a really popular commodity for a time there in World War II and post-World War II England and you can still find it for sale in some places. So how do you eat rose hips? Well, first you have to wait for them to ripen. So they'll come out in mid to late summer and they'll be small and hard and green at first, but then as they ripen, they'll get more plump and turn usually red, sometimes more of an orange color. So they ripen in early to mid fall, but usually you want to wait until late fall or winter to pick them. And the reason for that is that after the frost, they actually get a lot sweeter and softer. You might uh, be familiar with this from other fruits like crab apples do this, where kind of this fermentation process happens with the freezing and thawing cycle that makes the fruit softer and sweeter and just a lot more palatable. Rose hips can be eaten in many different ways. Most simply, you can just throw them in boiling water to make tea. You can also make jelly or jam or syrup as I just described, or even ketchup or barbecue sauce. There's lots of different options with rose hips. The main thing you wanna keep in mind is to avoid the seeds. The rose hip seeds have little scratchy hairs on them. So if you eat them whole, they'll actually irritate the back of your throat because of all those scratchy hairs. So you do want to avoid that. And the simplest way you can avoid that if the rose hips are small, like these are, is just to dry them whole or to use them whole by, for example, throwing them whole into tea would be the easiest way. 
If they're larger, you can cut them in half and scoop out the seeds and the hairy portion. Of course, with rose hips that are this small, it would be incredibly fiddly and very time consuming and just not practical at all. But if you're able to find ones that are around an inch in size, then that becomes a more practical option. But yeah, there's lots of recipes for different ways to use rose hips. So I recommend just doing some searches online or in your favorite wild food book and you'll find lots of different options. Now, if you're in the field with rose hips and you want to nibble on some, if they happen to be big enough, you can kind of eat around the edge like an apple and just avoid the hairy seeds that way. These ones are clearly very small and they're going to be hard to eat that way, but let me try to find a good one here. We had a, an early frost actually a few weeks ago, so some of these on here are quite gooey and soft. So I'm just gonna try to eat some of this pulp while avoiding the seeds, which is pretty difficult because in these small little tiny rose hips, there's a very small proportion of actual root pulp to seed. So I wish I had a bigger one to show you, but there's a little bit of pulp I can kind of scrape off the edges here. It's like getting on my fingers, turning my fingers red. Yeah, they're really tasty. They have a bit of a like sour apple like taste, like a bit like a like a sweet crab apple or like a sour domesticated apple. Definitely well worth trying if you can find them. All right, that concludes my video about rose hips. I hope that you learned a thing or two and I inspired you to go try some rose hips of your own. If you did enjoy the video, please hit the like button to my channel and ring the bell for notifications. It helps me out a lot for free. But if you do also happen to have a few extra dollars a month, you can head over to my Patreon. The link is in the description box down below. And on there you can pledge a monthly dollar amount to help me keep producing these free informative videos for everybody. So if you can do that, I would really appreciate it. If not, that's alright too. Either way, I hope you have a good day and happy foraging!